grateful for the invitation, so thank you very much. I also have to say that I do have a personal relationship with Hayek, although he has no idea about that. Um, <laughs> because I actually brought my very first paper, academic paper, pl published here in the UK about the meaning of Hayek for competition law. And when starting the, my PhD defense quite a few years ago now, they uh, member, one of the members of the jury said that someone who read about Hayek has to be a good person. So it makes us all here good persons, which is great news. Um, and so since then I've been a bit, you know, trying to, to keep in mind what is the, the meaning of his work and also trying to teach that to some of my students in the Netherlands, which is quite interesting. Um, and so what I thought I would be doing today is try to explore um, computational antitrust, and I will tell you in a minute about it, and see how the work of Hayek could actually help us to, to better uh, explore what might be, I think, the future of uh, antitrust enforcement. And so, if you could go to the next slides, and then click two times, three times then. Yes, thank you. Uh, so this is a bit of the idea of my presentation today. What I would like to do is to explain what is computational antitrust. Uh, knowing that I think the UK is the leading agency in the space, and then confront that with two main ideas when it comes to Hayek's work, at least in my opinion, the one of emergent order, and to see how competition antitrust can actually help to achieve that, and to better document that for competition agencies. This is part one, and part two is about the pretense of knowledge, and I think if indeed we agree with the idea that free market is in principle a good idea, I think we shouldn't fear putting some more data on the table to actually prove our points. So this is a bit of the, the structure of my presentation. If you could go to the next slides, I will start by explaining what is computational antitrust. If you can click one more time. Yes, two times, thank you. Um, so the idea isn't new, actually I was on my way here today listening to uh, Steven Pinker, new book about rationality, and I was listening to the chapter where he's actually discussing the work of Yebniz. The idea that if you had the right tools, then you can just calculate legal outcome. Of course this is not what we do, but I think the more it goes, the more it will become possible to calculate what might be the outcome of a certain case. Which is of course not without asking lots of questions as to you know, formal logic and whether or not we can actually put all of competition law into a computer. This is a bit of what I will explain in a minute. But if I try to translate that to the space of competition law, of course we've all read this paper by Richard Posner, actually explaining that the number one issue is the mismatch between the time for markets and the time for law. So it seems that if we could indeed calculate a bit of about what is competition law, then potentially we could not have, I think it would be a terrible mistake to have the lawyers ahead of the technology. I know we complain all the time, oh, the lawyers are far behind, and I think this is great, uh, but if they could be a little less behind, this would also be great news for all of us. If you could go to the next, yes, thank you very much. So the reason why I got interested in computational law, but this is not the, the main subject of my presentation today, is for this issue over here. Uh, we know that uh, we detect very few of the infringements to competition law, which might explain why there is now the DMA and the DMU and all of those initiatives. Um, and I think we can all agree that this isn't a great news because it means that if you infringe competition law, most likely you'll be fine. And we have no, by the way, no empirical work as to the detection rate of abuses of dominant position. It does not exist. I don't know why, maybe for some economists in the room, uh, but I, I would love to see that. But we kind of know that it will be you know, just a matter of one or two percent of those practices. If you could go to the next, thank you. Um, and so, as a result, what we see is that antitrust agencies rely on reactive methods, uh, and the more it goes, the more they actually rely on those methods. This is according to the OECD. It amounts to 80% of all cases in Europe, 90% in the United States. I'd be more than curious to see what's gonna be the numbers in the UK in just a few years. Uh, but I, I think I, there is potentially a road for something different, which is for competition agencies to be more proactive instead of saying, you know what, this is too complicated, therefore I'm going to just write a list of 17 practices, which is exactly what we have with the Digital Markets Act. And I'm doubtful as to two things. First, the European Commission telling us in page 8 of the DMA that they have sufficient experience, when in fact none of those practices ever been to the General Courts or the Court of Justice. 
Uh, and knowing that some of those practices were actually, as the European Commission explains, not covered in competition law. So how could you have experience in something which is entirely new, supposedly? So this is the bit of why I got interested in this idea of computational law. If you could go to the next one, yes, thank you. Once again, yes. So this is me being negative. Uh, if we look at some numbers about the amount of data being produced every year, we see that it is ex exploding. Uh, so we produced last year 44 zettabytes. If you could click one more, one more time. I uh, no idea what was a zettabyte. So a zettabyte equals one trillion gigabytes. So last year we produced 44 of those zettabytes, which is 44, 40 times more bytes than there are stars in the universe. This is what we produced last year. And as you can see, in just 15 years, we'll reach over 2,000 zettabytes of data. And it seems to me that without the right tool, then agencies will be lost. And if they are lost, I'm afraid that most of what they will do is not to say, oh, too bad for us, but again, to come up with more GMAs and more GMUs. And I'm not sure this is the right approach. If you could go to the next. Yes, uh, quite a few times. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, yeah, we've got it working. yes, thank you very much. This is great. <coughs> okay, and so this is for the detection part, uh, but I do not want again to insist on this, but I think something which is central is this idea over here, which is that even after you have detected the potential practice, then you do have a problem of one, analyzing the quantity of data and then trying to better understand what you have in front of you instead of being just static and taking pictures of market and to say, well, you know, the picture doesn't look good, therefore I'm going to intervene. And so very interested to see that the, what was actually mentioned this morning in the uh, advertisement inquiries, uh, by the CMA, they had access to Google and Bing search queries for one week, and they ended up with between three and four billion data entries. So I think this requires to have some right, the right tools, but this is just the quantity. And something that concerns me very much is the nature of what we study in the field of competition law. Again, this was a bit of what we discussed last night, but in a nutshell, I think the idea that we could just rely on neoclassical economic theory and take pictures of market and only consider the substitutes and all that has to go away. I think we already have the tools to let it go on the idea of the average consumer. I never met anyone average. I don't know who's average. And I think we can actually provide agencies with something a bit better, which again, I think will play in the interest of the free market eventually. So how can we take behavioral sciences into account and how can we use computer science this is a bit of the, the overreaching idea. So I think we have two solutions against this background and the growing number of data being put out there. First, we could say, well, the market will take care of it and do nothing and delete competition law. This is one option. Or we could say, which is the exact opposite, well, I'm gonna just regulate everything ex ante. But even if you do that, and the European Com it was reported that the European Commission hired just 80 person to enforce the GMA, which I think is far from being sufficient, because of course companies will, apply, will argue that they are not gatekeepers, that the practice is not exactly the one covered in the GMA. So you end up with the exact same issue. And so against this background, I think if we don't give up, which I put in a bit of a provocative way, we can rely on computational antitrust. As you could see, this is definitely what I favor. So I'm gonna try to convince you of the facts, exploring two of Hayek's um, uh, main findings. The one about discovering competition as a discovery process. And I think that we could document that way better than what we do today using the right tools. And then I want to discuss the pretense of knowledge, which applies to what agencies do as of today, but also that is a risk for computational antitrust. The idea that you could compute the entire world, I think might be possible one day. Happy to discuss that over the coffee, uh, but we are far from that. So here, first I will start with this quote by Hayek. We must show how a solution is produced by the interactions of people. And this is something that we are never studying in the field of competition law. This relates to the idea of complexity theory, that interactions will actually change the natures of agents, it will change the environment, the change in the environment will change the natures of agents. And that we do not study because we start again from neoclassical economic theory in which we presume certain characteristics for the model and try to verify if they are true. So, what can we do? I think we can do a lot of things when it comes to understanding better practices, but also understanding better market dynamics. For the detection, uh, certain agencies, and this might be the case in the UK, I don't want to disclose 
private information but what you could do is to use uh, web scraping tools to try to understand what's happening out there on the markets, which is here to detect practices. What you could do also is to use natural language processing in which basically you provide the machine with millions of documents and ask the machine to give you the key insights of those uh, documents. But what you can also do if you do that, for instance, is to document why a market which was deemed to have tipped is actually now untipped um, and why do we see strong competition in this market. This is something that competition agencies do not do. I'm always puzzled to see that in the annual report, the main thing they would say is, oh, this year, last year we imposed for that amount of fines, therefore give us more budgets. And I understand why, because in a sense, they don't have the capacity and the time to go back and do retrospective studies. And I think it would be great to provide them with such a tool so that we could, again, better understand what's happening out there. For the analysis, um, a friend of mine, Nicolas Petit, published a great book, Monigopoly Scenario, in which he actually showed how using the 10Ks, which are the financial statements in the US, you could actually understand competitive dynamic better. And again, I think this could be scaled up with uh, public documentation sent to several agencies to again document better why markets are working and why they are not working. So it's something that we could do as we speak. We haven't talked much about killer acquisitions yet, but I'm sure it's coming. Um, I think this idea that we can detect those acquisitions just by looking at the turnover and the market shares of the company uh, isn't good enough. Uh, I think we can have no choice but to study the actual technology at stake in the actual acquisition. And so in a paper that we published within the Competition on Antitrust Project at Stanford University by MIT researchers, nothing to do with competition law, but they actually explore how by studying what they call the fitness of a company, which is the link between the growth of a company and the number of connection that company has with other companies, you can actually predict the evolution of a company way better than just looking at Instagram, do I like the logo, the colors, and to say, well, the acquisition by Facebook was anti-competitive. So this is something that they explore, and I think something to be indeed explored, so that we can prevent, again, reversing the burden of proof, and to say that if you acquire, you have to explain why this is good. If agencies were to use that, we could avoid such an extreme uh, rule here in that case. And for policies, I mentioned already that we could do more retrospective studies. Um, this is something uh, that we could do also, by the way, and this was mentioned uh, right before me, regarding the actual legislations to see if remedies are effective, if certain legislations are effective or not. And for that, quite a few things that we could be using. The first over here, I don't really have the time to show you the video, but this is agent-based modeling. You may have heard about it. The very basic idea is that you create a computer simulation you assign unique characteristics to all of the agents doing playing the simulation. You could have four million of them, and then you run the simulation according to certain uh, rules. So if I could show you this one, you will see that you have actually lots of agents, and you might say, okay, if 10 agents come together, then they go to the right. If you transpose that to competition, it could be if the prices of a product goes up by a value of 10 points, then the agent goes to the right, which is they exit the market. Uh, this is a bit being used in economic literature, but not at all in competition policy. And I think this could be convenient to end up with that and doing a simulation, and this is possible, agent-based modeling simulation for the GDPR. You could have seen that the, you know, the players will go here, which is not to comply with GDPR or to exit the market or not to put a new product out there uh, for everyone. This is something which is dear to me. Also another paper that we published in which what they've done is that they've analyzed all the contributions made to the European Commission when they asked for contribution regarding the DMA. And what they explained and showed using machine learning is that depending on the size of a company, they do not understand the keywords such as dominant gatekeepers, monopolistic, monopolization and newcomers in the exact same way. And they also have totally opposite feeling as to whether or not this is good to be dominant, what it means to be a gatekeeper. And that, I think, could also inform the way by which we draft legislation and try to avoid the keyword for which you see that there is a, a, a great dispersion as to how they understand those uh, concepts. So something that could be, you know, in ID in trying to also fight against regulatory uh, capture over here. You have some more very fancy graphic over here that I just wanted to, to show you. Um, 
I think all that leads us to the following, which is that, of course, we could discuss how to improve competition law, such as it is, but I think eventually all of those tools will impact the substance of competition law, a bit of what I discussed today, uh, and if we want to discuss that, I think we could indeed use all of those computational tools, which are computer-based problem-solving methods, to actually document something which is complexity theory. Um, unfortunately, I think uh, Brian Archer, uh, Nielsen and Winter, who actually worked on those ideas, will never get a Nobel Prize in economic theory, so we have to, you know, forego the idea. Uh, but this could be something which is relevant for us. And again, this is exactly what Hayek was already mentioning. So here you could see that he was saying that understanding the evolution of markets requires to understand the evolutionary formation of complex systems. And again, this idea of biology and organic growth of market is not something that we can capture if we use the tools such as we use. And yet I think this will be a very strong argument to try to understand when to intervene, but also to try not to hamper with this uh, Darwinian process, in a sense. So this is how I represent complexity theory, but if you want, you, what you have over here are firms, and all of those firms have connections, and they use technology, and you can study the depth of the, te the, depth of the technology, or the varieties of different technologies, and see how they actually influence one another. We know from empirical work that most of the disruption actually appear by a combination of existing technologies. And yet again, this is something that we cannot actually put out there and operationalize when it comes to competition law. And I think this is a shame because we can say disruptive innovation all we want, but as an agency, if you need to make a decision, uh, you know that the market might be disrupted, but then what do you do with the merger? Do you do nothing because potentially one day there will be a disruption? I think this could be helpful in trying to understand if and when a disruption might be coming, or at least what are the elements that you need for disruption to be possible. So this was what I wanted to mention for discovering competition. Briefly, I do want to mention the pretense of knowledge, which applies again to agencies such as they behave today, but also to competition law antitrust. I do not want to give the impression that with a computer we can solve it all, because this is far from true. I've listed here a few challenges. Challenge number one, which fields of competition law can be computed? Um, I think predatory pricing is super easy to compute. I could create a decision tree uh, and then you know, give the tool to companies or agencies and to say, okay, this is most likely predatory pricing or not. The, the criteria, the legal test is very clear. But if I try to compute the quality of products, then it becomes very complex. What is a better product than another one? What are, what are the criteria that you need to put into the machine? This is complex, but I think highly interesting to think about that and to think again how we can operationalize all of those ideas. This was challenge number one. Challenge number two, who should develop those tools? Should it be private companies? Should it be agencies? And once they have developed the tools, how can they actually get the data necessary to feed those tools? Uh, this is something that we could be discussing. I believe the UK has kind of a alliance with uh, other uh, common law countries, including Australia and a few others, to try to develop those tools together. And this is a bit for what I'm trying to, to push. Three, George Akiloff, a Nobel Prize winner, uh, actually said that, and he was complaining about the economic field, to say that there are certain things that cannot be approached the hard way. By hard way, what it meant is algebra. And I think the same is true when it comes to competition law, and it would be a mistake to say everything that cannot be computed therefore does not exist, because it means that all of the qualitative aspects, which might again be necessary to explain why markets are efficient or not, <laughs> might be gone. Challenge number four, procedural fairness. Uh, the CMA, again, I think is the world leading agency when it comes to all of those uh, talking points. But what if you have private enforcement versus a company with lots of computational power versus another one with no computational power? Is it fair? Uh, how do you make sure that you understand the machine learning and the way we've done the unsupervised machine learning in which you choose totally randomly a certain number of clusters? So those are very technical aspects we need to discuss because I think this is coming in the space. And the last one, it's to know the limits. Again, we are far from being able to complete the theory of everything. Uh, Schumpeter wrote about that, Brian Archer and of course Hayek also wrote uh, uh, something uh, very relevant in the space. 
And so here, to uh, use this one, I think that potentially the curious task of computational law could be to actually prove agencies what they do not know and what they have no idea how to compute or how, how to calculate. And therefore, here you could talk about policy, what should we do in that case? I will argue that they should probably do nothing, but this is just my personal preference. All that are the challenges. The last thing that I want to say is that although there are limitations, um, the same is true for weather forecasts. And actually, we know with using empirical work that weather forecast is much better today than it was 40 years ago, which might be a surprise because today apparently it was a sunny day. But um, I don't know if you've seen this movie, Grahon Day. Um, what's happening is that he's stuck in the movie. Sorry for the spoiler. Um, and I think that if we do not put d some of those tools to use, we're going to be stuck in the same argumentation in which agencies argue at the micro level the this practice is bad, and some people will argue that yes, but Google and Facebook provide us with some good product and services without trying a way to actually operationalize and to intervene only when necessary. So this is why, in my view, if we truly believe in the power of free markets, we have to be able to document it and to uh, find ways to provide agencies with something which is a bit more concrete than just beautiful theories. So. This is all that I wanted to say. I think the challenge is the following. What we've seen is that the Sherman Act was introduced with a non-complex economy. The companies were just producing their goods and products and services without interaction with all the companies. I could see why the Sherman Act was good enough for that. Eventually, the economy got digitalized, and therefore, we also digitalize you know, the way by which we apply competition law. Uh, but I think this needs to go a step further. And if we want to understand what's happening on digital market, we have to use digital tools. Otherwise, you end up again with the DMA and the list of those 17 practices. I could be discussing that for a very long time, but I'm sure this will be covered today. So the idea will be to match the substance with the methods. And I realize that talking about the methods or talking about institutions, something that we have done already today, is not very sexy. And yet I think this is actually the key of the battle for the coming years. So this is all that I wanted to tell you. Uh, all of our publications regarding competition law are open access on Stanford website. Uh, so feel free to ask me a question right now. Among, uh, around a cup of coffee or to just send me an email. And again, thank you very much for the invitation. <laughs> yes, very convenient. Thank Are you. there any questions for Thibaut? We have a, a few minutes for questions before coffee break. OK, well, can I ask Too a tempting. question? Too tempting. Sure, of course. Yeah. Um, you were, I guess, quite critical of the, the lack of sophisticated use of data by competition authorities. No. Sorry. You, you, you were um, quite critical about the um, perhaps a bit unsophisticated use of data by competition authorities today. Um, are they making any efforts to improve upon that? Are you in touch with, obviously Michael's not here anymore, are you in touch with people at the CMA and at DG Comp to try and improve that? I know the CMA has this tool called DATA, D-A-Y-T-A, Yep. or something like that, that yep. they're trying to develop. Is that the kind of thing you have in mind? Yes. So what I've done when created, create, creating this project is that I've gathered all of the competition agencies that I could to actually you know, share articles and thoughts and good practices regarding those tools. Uh, so there are 55 competition agencies part of the project. The UK is part of it. Um, uh, the team is um, um, the, the leader of the team in the UK is uh, Stephen Hunt, uh, and I think he's doing a great job. Uh, in the European Commission, it's a bit more complex. I could be discussing that in private, uh, but they are interested. And Digit Digit has some great tools. I think it is the experience in the UK. I think is very very interesting because what they reported, and now this is public information, is that when they had to do all of that because of Brexit and because they knew that they will have more enforcement, they have decided, well, you know, if we want to analyze 4 billion data entries, we can, we can hire all the interns that we want, it won't do the trick. So we have to use that. And this was the reason why they could politically push for you know, the development of those tools. But apparently internally, this was very complex. The case handlers were saying, well, you know, computational is complex enough. I don't want to even learn about computer science. What are you telling me right now? But they actually showed how they could be using that. And now they have the exact opposite problem. 
by which the case handlers go to the team and say, I have a problem, I have a case, do you have a tool so that I can actually solve the case? And of course, this is more complex than that. Uh, but I, I, I think the same, I hope the same will be happening a bit everywhere, because otherwise what you have is that once it's convenient, competition agencies talk about innovation. So this is the Dojipo merger. European Commission says that potentially the merger is bad for a competitor that does not even exist and future innovation. But when it comes to you know trying to protect innovation, then they don't even talk about it. So again, I think this is why this is absolutely central. Uh, but I am pretty confident that most of the agencies, the DOJ, the FTC, the big ones are part of the project and yeah, trying to, to really understand what's happening. Um, I think I was thrilled to see that the DOJ sent their employees on a voluntary basis to the MIT to learn from a technical perspective about blockchain and AI and how to use it in enforcement capacity. The FTC is also doing that. And I realize it comes at the risk of you know, them being over um, efficient in a sense. Uh, so that's why we, as lawyers, we do want to talk about procedural fairness and how to ensure you know, the presumption of innocence and all that. Um, but I think most agencies are going in the right direction. And again, if you steadily, you know, firmly believe that markets are efficient, I think we shouldn't fear, and I certainly do not fear ha them having more data and being able to be more precise. And I published an op-ed in Le Monde, the French newspaper, uh, saying that the European Commission should actually invest more. And I received a lot of support from people within the European Commission telling me, please publish more of that because we need these kind of things to push internally to actually have more budget and avoid some of the, you know, ex ante, uh, I'm, uh, I can understand it all and uh, therefore everything is, uh, you know, put in a black marble. So I am pretty confident, so that's why I wanted to, you know, I showed you the negative aspect of what's coming, but I also wanted to leave you on a positive note, uh, hopefully. Well, thank you well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.